Good morning, folks, and thank you all so much for coming out to the fourth of our live weekly Q&As in our Meals That Change the World series with Dr. Laura Carlson for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, Laura and I are going to be diving into the excellent questions that you sent us this week in response to her fourth lecture, looking at the, the incredible uh, culinary legacy of the, the humble potato. Uh, so we've got a, really a wealth of, of great questions uh, to run through uh, this morning. So uh, without any further ado, I want to ask you all at home to, to join me in giving your warmest, curious minds welcome to Dr. Laura Carlson. How are you, Laura? Great, great. How are you? Very good, very good. Always a pleasure to, to, to dive into uh, our weekly culinary conversations on Friday morning. Uh, this week's lecture was, as, as we've come to expect from you, another barn burner. We, we zoomed all the way from Mexico in the 1500s to Paris to, uh, in the 1700s and the, the great work of Antoine Augustin Parmentier, his role in um, recommending the potato as a life-saving food, and then his role in featuring it in a series of truly opulent banquets where he showed its great culinary potential. Um, so, I, I, Laura, I want to, I think, dive right into the questions we got, which covered, I think, a, you know, a wide spectrum of different ideas and perspectives. Um, and the first one comes from audience member Carol Carpentier, um, who asked, had a question related to the toxicity of potatoes. Um, early on in your lecture, you described potatoes having made the Spaniards sick and that um, Peruvians often eat, ate them with a clay sauce to counteract their toxicity. Uh, Carol wanted to know how this toxicity was dealt with today. Um, yeah, what, how, how do we avoid those issues in the, in the modern era? This is a great question, and it, it has a bit of a two-part answer because it both relates to, as you say, the actual toxicity of potatoes, but also the Spaniards when they encountered potatoes for the first time, this new food stuff that they had never seen anything like it before. Um, it was much more of a perceived fear that these things were poisonous. Um, so when we're looking at the Spanish say first encounterings of the potato, it, it really isn't anything that the potato itself was making them ill. They just did not recognize that they didn't know what to do with it. They would see, say the local communities eating it, but there was a real fear that it was in some way poison. So we don't actually have any good firm records of potatoes at that time in say the 16th or 17th centuries when they were first encountering the foodstuffs actually making them sick. But we see a lot of writings about, you know, these local communities are eating this, this unusual food stuff and, and it looks unlike anything we've ever seen before. And we really just don't know what it is, how to cook it, how to prepare it. And, you know, a very genuine fear of, will this unknown food make us ill? But we don't have any record of it actually making the Spaniards ill. So that gets us to more of the earlier question and kind of more of the, um, kind of like physical components of the potato of, yes, indeed, wild potatoes, very, very early kind of pre-domestication of potatoes, they indeed are, are, are toxic. They uh, will cause quite a bit of stomach upset. Um, usually will not do anything to, to seriously harm you, but it isn't a pleasant experience eating a wild potato um, that does have some of these still toxic properties. And I mean, they're common properties just to essentially keep the plant healthy to prevent people from eating it or, or prevent animals from eating it. So it was believed, and this has been only really pieced together in, in recent years, that the, the clay or our, our, our sea in um, as it's often known, or chaco, that the components in that clay actually have kind of like Alka-Seltzer properties or kind of stomach calming properties that they would counteract this natural toxicity in the wild potato. But this blend, this necessity, necessity to eat um, or have the clay sauce with the potato was only something 
in kind of prehistoric eras when we're looking at the pre-domesticated potato. Once we actually see the domestication of the potato in Peru and a lot of places in South America start to develop, one of the first things that obviously gets lost is this toxicity. So by the time we're certainly talking about the Spaniards arriving, there's no, we don't believe any physical need to have the chaco or the clay sauce to counteract any toxic after effects of eating these potatoes. But it is believed that this tradition of making this, this sauce out of clay kind of in, is inherited through the generations and just kind of keeps on going through the culinary uh, traditions of many of the Peruvian communities. Um, but it has its ancestors in this kind of counteracting effect, but now it's just enjoyed as a lovely sauce. Um, it doesn't actually have any of those toxic preventing properties. Okay. Um, shifting gears a bit, uh, Cyrus writes in with, I think, a, sort of an astute uh, historical question here. Uh, what were the attitudes like in France towards the kinds of gut-busting feasts that Parmentier hosted, uh, giving their proximity to a period of starvation and famine? Was there any kind of backlash? And just to add on to that, not only proximity to starvation and famine, but proximity to the French Revolution just a few years later. How were these feasts perceived? Was, was this held against him in the court of public opinion? That's a great question. And again, it has almost a two-part answer in that, yes, these elaborate displays of wealth and excess up to leading up to the French Revolution certainly were not really reading the room correctly, shall we say, um, really were not seen to be to be great examples of when so much of the population, a majority of the population either doesn't have enough to eat, um, you know, is, is starving, is on very, very thin ground in terms of just um, being able to survive, watching, you know, banquet after banquet after banquet be served, I mean, particularly directed in the, in the direction of the palace um, and the other French aristocracy was not received well. What perhaps Parmentier was able to really thread a very thin line, thin, um, thread the needle here, and yes, certainly he was part of the aristocracy, you know, he was an elite, um, a member of kind of, um, you know, uh, the upper classes of, of France. And so yes, he was partaking in these or, or even giving these very luxurious feasts. But the thing that saved him was the focus on this potato that even at the time was considered to be a fairly humble ingredient. And I mean, his, uh, let's say rebranding or attempts to market the potato through these feasts were to try and get the elites on board to say, yes, of course we can do this. But really it still had this very Republican association to it and that this was something that was going to save so many farmers, villages, towns, French populations, populations throughout Europe, because it was something they could take and grow while um, say their fields were resting from growing wheat. So it really still, or kind of had started in France um, with this introduction, as already a, a thing of the people, an ingredient of the people. So he was able to kind of, ha ironically, have his cake and eat it too, to allude to another <laughs> you know, famous um, issue with food in the French Revolution, um, in that yes, he ha was having these excessive banquets, but he was doing it to essentially keep the people of France from starvation. Um, so he was really still seen as a, as a hero in many ways. And mm. even when we get into the French Revolution itself, the potato is seen as a Republican ingredient, uh, an ingredient of the people. So I think I mentioned in the lecture, gardens were torn up in say palaces throughout France, um, you know, ripping out all of the beautiful roses and tulips and what have you, and planted with potatoes as a symbol that these trappings of the elite were going to be swept aside and torn up and be planted with this, the symbol of the people, which was the potato. So yes, in mm. some ways, not great to have an excessive banquet filled with food when so many people didn't have enough to eat. But I feel like he was able to still keep on the right side of public opinion because it was featuring this, this food that was saving so many lives. Right, right. And then looking at sort of public policy in this era vis-a-vis -vis the potato, um, 
uh, Michel Thioré writes, uh, did taxes on farmers in 18th century Europe play a role in shifting cultivation away from some crops to potatoes? So were there actual top-down directed efforts from governments in on the continent encouraging the cultivation of potatoes? Oh, certainly, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, taxes being one element of things that farmers would see, well, I have so much taxation is going to be placed on my wheat harvest, less taxation will be placed on my potato harvest, let's, let's shift to potatoes more. Um, and that is an economic mindset from the farmers themselves, but the taxes themselves, again, as you were saying, a top-down maneuver, absolutely, there were high levels of encouragement for as many farmers as possible to not only shift partially or even completely to potatoes um, because there had been, as I mentioned in the lecture, bread was such a staple for so much of Europe's population, France and beyond, um, and obviously relying on wheat harvest or grain harvest. And those wheat harvests and grain harvests would fail with such, I don't want to say regularity, but it happened frequently enough that people realized that if the majority of the population's daily diet, let's say 50, 70% is based on bread um, and bread is not available because the harvest has failed. What are you going to do? What, what is a solution to that um, inevitable failure again? And so there were so many encouragements to say, please start planting potatoes that this will offset any kind of grain harvest failure so that we have something else for you to eat, um, that you will have another source of um, subsistence essentially. So we see this in Prussia, you know, as I, I, I was talking that even before France, Prussia was very much encouraged to say, if you are not growing potatoes already, please start growing them and we will, you know, in, provide financial stimulus for you to grow potatoes and encouragement for you to grow potatoes. But even if you continue to grow wheat, great, not a problem, we all love bread. Um, but in your off, when your fields are resting, which you would have to do if you were growing wheat, start planting potatoes and those will actually help replenish the soil anyway, so that you can have a harvest of wheat and then a harvest of potatoes, harvest of wheat, a harvest of potatoes. And now we have both ends of the spectrum covered. So absolutely. Um, and I mean, that's kind of to get back to the famines and, and kind of protests and, and a lot of these reactions that we saw leading up to the French Revolution. People were protesting about the lack of food 100%, but almost entirely based on bread, the, that lack of bread in their diet because of these grain harvest failures. And that gets into the whole let them eat cake situation if there isn't bread available, which ironically enough, if we translate the actual French, she's actually saying let them eat brioche, um, which is a form of bread. Um, and I mean, it's apocryphal whether or not she said this to begin with, but this was an attempt to say, all right, if we don't have bread, you can have potatoes. Right, right. And then this inevitably, I think, brings up another exa famous example of history where we saw this intersection of potatoes in relation to hunger and famine. Um, Carla writes in to ask about the Irish potato famine uh, in the 1800s. Why weren't the lessons of Parmentier vis-a-vis -vis using potatoes to stave off famine applied there? Oh, this is a great question. And I do wish I had had more time in the lecture to go into it because the Irish potato famine is essentially the worst possible outcome that was probably in, entirely unexpected. I mean, no one could have seen this happening before the fact. Um, this was a, the unfortunate outcome of all of those efforts um, that we saw in say the 18th century and even into the early 19th century to say either stop planting wheat, plant potatoes, or balance out your crops of wheat or whatever else you're growing and potatoes. Because potatoes had been seen as, you know, it's a fast growing plant, it's an easy way to get more subs um, sustenance. And particularly for say the great swaths of the population that were food insecure, this was seen as, you know, the silver bullet, this is gonna solve all of our problems with famine. What they didn't see coming, and this is what happened with the Irish potato famine, is a fungus actually infecting the potato plant itself. So we had been worried about all these failures of grain harvests. Okay, that's fair enough. 
the problem was once this fungus infected the potato plants in Ireland and actually started in mainland Europe, we think it started in Belgium, it just decimated all of these crops, which farmers had now grown to rely on in that, well, hey, if my grain harvest fails, that's fine. I've got the potatoes. The potatoes, try and true, they will never fail me. So more and more farmers were growing more and more potatoes, almost exclusively potatoes, thinking that the crop would never fail. The crop failed once this fungus infected them. So now you have up to half of this crop failing with now all these people just growing potatoes and it absolutely decimated Ireland. And so that was the issue is that it wasn't necessarily a lesson that they weren't taking from Parmentier. They were taking Parmentier's recommendation of plant as many potatoes as you can. They had, but no one had foreseen the potato crop failing. That was the issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Laura, shifting gears as we head into sort of the final portion of our Q&A here, um, lots of mouthwatering questions about the many delightful uh, preparations of the potato that flourished on Parmentier's dinner table and that have flourished uh, in the centuries since. Um, so uh, just to sort of put a fine point on these, I want to begin with a uh, a question from Patricia Frankie Deverell, um, uh, who look who wanted to hear a little bit more about evolution of the French those that is very much steeped in mythology of where exactly did this iconic element of certainly American cuisine, um, but beloved all over the globe by this point, where does it come from? And there are many different conflicting theories. I mean, one of the main kind of, let's say, threads of history that has led to the French fries we know today um, does take us from Parmentier to Thomas Jefferson and then kind of to the American people in general, um, that of course Thomas Jefferson witnessed all of these various ways of, of cooking um, at Parmentier's feasts, took them back, um, particularly enjoyed because why wouldn't you enjoy anything fried in butter or oil? Um, you know, the enjoyment of kind of potatoes sliced, fried in oil, um, and, and that took off well, like a house on fire, understandably. Um, in terms of it being called a French fry, because certainly there are even even today in French cuisine, many ways of preparing a potato cooked in some sort of fat, um, oil or butter or what have you. Where do we exactly get the French fry? Again, a good question. And, you know, if, if we were in another time and space, I would actually say, if you ever have the chance, you must go to Bruges um, in, in Belgium, which has the actual French fry museum, which I was able to go and visit, um, I think about 10 years ago now, which will tell you more than you ever wanted to know about the French fry. But um, of course they insisting that it's, it's Belgian, not French anyway, but um, that it is believed that in terms of where the term French comes from, I mean, we could say perhaps it is Thomas Jefferson bringing back this experience in France. So obviously he would say, well, they prepared it that, this way in France. And so thus this is the French fried potato. Um, and so then it just gets shortened up um, over the years to the French fry because, you know, you don't really worry about um, anyone being confused when you say French fry, that you're referring to French fried tomatoes or French fried beets or something like that. When you say French fries, pretty much everyone knows that you mean potatoes. And so the, the ubiquity of it simply got us shortened to this form. Um, I mean, there is also the, the idea of, we think of um, the traditional or shall we say more common French fry of being those kind of uh, tiny slices, if you will, of, um, of potatoes rather than say, you know, like a wedge or anything like that. Um, Frenching was a term um, that was often applied to that specific look of, of slicing or cutting into say like a chicken or another vegetable. So there may be something there as well. That's another thread that it wasn't just Thomas Jefferson or someone else coming over and saying, oh, well, this is how they prepared it in France, but it's a little bit more specific of a culinary technique of Frenching something was specifically the cut of what we would say today is the, the iconic shape 
of the French fry, at least, you know, I'm thinking of the, the fast food French fry. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's many other ways that we can trace how popular they become. And that becomes an entirely different discussion about the 20th century and, you know, say um, North American soldiers going off to, to war in Europe in uh, World War One, World War Two, experiencing these these fried potatoes, bringing them back and a, and a love of um, this French fried style um, that became very much popular then in the 40s, 50s and 60s with the growth of things like the fast food establishments and say McDonald's, Burger King, all those other kind of hamburger places that we think of as being the iconic uh, French fry purveyors, if you will. So there's a whole story there. Um, mm -hmm. I would say if and when you can, the Bruges Museum of the French Fry is is where to go. I, although they, of course, just call it the Fry Museum because yes, the, the Belgians know their way around a, a French fry or a frite. The, they they are masters of it for sure. And then just to, we're running out of time, but just to close quickly, um, you know, you alluded to the the many wonderful different preparations of the potato beyond the French what we now think of as the French fry that would have flourished on Parmentier's dinner table. Um, could you talk about the role of various dishes then um, that they played in the sort of the development of, um, you know, what we've kind of come to think of as the tradition of fine French cuisine in a century since. In your next lecture, you're going to talk a bit about um, Georges Auguste Escoffier, who codified many of those great uh, recipes. So talk to us about the the varieties of great potato dishes that existed and, and that played a role in the development of French cuisine. Absolutely. And, and again, this could be a five hour lecture if we had the time. But what I do find interesting is that once Parmentier, you know, is this this folk hero, the Johnny Appleseed of potatoes for France, shall we say, we do see it adopted very quickly in cookbooks, um, kind of the written text, the written rec written reflections of how people we think are cooking around the time. So one of the more interesting tidbits I, I always love about the potato that by 1793, we see an entire cookbook dedicated to the potato. It's actually the first French cookbook um, that we know is written entirely by a woman and it's called La Cuisine Republicaine. I so apologize for my French accent, but Republican cooking essentially, right? We're at Republican cuisine right in the heart of the French uh, revolution. It's an entire potato driven cookbook um, written by a woman. And so already we have at least the uh, revolutionaries adopting all of these different ways of, of cooking potatoes. So we already know it's, it's starting to get incorporated. Um, we have of course, Napoleon getting into the 19th century also was a big fan of potatoes. So the potatoes seem to become enmeshed with French identity very, very quickly on. And so this is going hand in hand, of course, with what we consider to be the foundational period of traditional French cuisine. So it's perhaps not surprising that we see both on the kind of French revolutionary side and Napoleonic French side, if both are pro-potato, they, all of a sudden you start to see everything and anything being done with the potato for the table, whether or not it's um, kind of the humble table or the table for the emperor uh, Napoleon. I mean, we have great, probably apocryphal stories about um, the souffléed potato being invented in uh, the late 1830s, essentially the concept of the twice fried potato, because essentially by that point in time, this gets this gets into the details of French history of revolutionaries, Napoleon, back to kings and queens. But um, we have this element of um, essentially royalty being late for a, a meal. And so the cook, having fried his potatoes once, realized that king and queen hadn't arrived yet. He's going to have to fry the potatoes twice. And so thus we get these kind of puffed up souffle potatoes, which become an iconic element of, of French cuisine and kind of, kind of Western European, um, also Belgian cuisine as well. So we have these things just kind of getting incorporated and getting incorporated and getting incorporated more and more and more. And so again, by Escoffier's time, a turn of 19th, 20th century, they are ingredients that of course you would work with at, at the finest tables um, for haute cuisine, um, even though yes, they have this humble association that you know they are gonna keep the people of France from starving, 
through these associations with Napoleon and kind of royalty throughout the 19th century, they never were considered to be an ingredient unfit for the highest of tables. So we see anything and everything being done with them, sauces, um, flambéed, souffléed, all these other elements um, that they become just another integral element of, of fine French cuisine as they continue to be today. Indeed, indeed, and they will they will have a you know a, a cameo in your next lecture when we're going to be surveying the the opulent Edwardian feast served aboard the Titanic, where the meals took a great deal of inspiration from Escoffier. Um, so, so more to come for all you potato lovers out there. More more to whet your appetite next week. Um, I will say uh, lecture five, which I've had the privilege of getting a preview of made me perhaps hungrier than any other lecture so far. <laughs> so uh, Laura, we've run out of time, but it is as always a great pleasure to check in with you on Friday morning. Uh, do you wanna leave our, our audience members at home with any any uh, little uh, tidbits on what you're planning to cook this weekend? Anything on, on, your, on your dinner table that makes you yeah. excited? I am I'm hoping to try my hand at uh, at some pretzels this weekend, actually. I have um, adopted the sourdough trend and I'm gonna try and make some sourdough soft pretzels. That is gonna be my my weekend game plan. Very nice, that sounds delightful. Uh, well, to all of you at home, uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, please continue to share your great questions with us uh, as we head into our, our uh, last two a live Q and A's over the next couple of weeks and, and share your, you know, share what you're eating and enjoying it at home as well. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Absolutely. But in the meantime, uh, on behalf of the entire team at Hot Dogs, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful weekend. Great, thank you. <laughs>